Good morning, participants. Uh, uh, we are going to wait uh, a minute or two to allow all the people who are currently signing on to get in. Um, please be patient. We'll be with you in a second. I sound like a telecom um, message. It's one minute past, we'll wait one more minute and then we'll begin. Okay, it's uh, two minutes past 11 on my uh, watch here, and I think it's uh, time to start. My name is uh, Alon Reyes. I am the uh, financier of Reyes Corp. And uh, what I do, or what Reyes Corp does, is look after entrepreneurs. We've been doing this for 21 years with 13 and a half thousand uh, businesses that we have supported over that time. And when COVID uh, happened, uh, you know, even though I was 20 years into the business, it was a massive shock to an established business such as myself. And I, I was wondering where this thing would go and, you know, whether we indeed would survive this, not knowing how this would pan out. And many entrepreneurs that uh, we, look, we look after were feeling exactly the same thing. And it felt like government was very slow to respond. Um, and then the private sector stepped in and many, many funds that were created, one of which, of course, is the South Africa Future Trust, uh, which came to the party to support small business. And so I'm very proud to be facilitating this webinar today um, with some very esteemed panelists and um, some very interesting uh, information that uh, having read through the, the research that came to, um, to the fore, which our experience both in our environment and also didn't experience. And so this is gonna be a very interesting conversation today. Um, the title for today's webinar is called From Survival to Opportunities Through COVID-19 and Beyond, um, this, the SA Future Trust Baseline Report. And when I was reading that title, um, I read it in two ways, from survival to opportunity through COVID-19, as in through this, the con concept of through getting through COVID-19, uh, but also as a result of, the word through as a result of, and what I've seen is that COVID-19 has also created huge opportunity within small business. Anyway, enough of that. Let me introduce our, our panelists uh, for today. Um, the co-authors uh, of the report uh, are, are with us today. It's Ashley Finmunda, who's economist and social investment associate at the Oppenheimer Generations Philanthropies, um, together with Dr. Emmanuel Wusser Sashera, who is an economist and deputy research director at the Brenthurst Foundation. 
So those are the co-authors of the report. And also with us on the panel is Nadia Musaji, who is co-founder of WOMHUB, an innovation company creating gender parity uh, through education and technology. And she's also the owner of not one, but three Turkish restaurants in Cape Town. And we're going to hear her incredible story around uh, COVID and the South Africa Future Trust. Um, somebody who's uh, no stranger to the small uh, business ecosystem in South Africa is Carl Lotta. He's chairman of the SA Small and Medium Enterprise Association. Um, and it's a small and medium enterprises association. And he will be giving uh, us his perspective today um, on his experience through, through this journey. So welcome panelists. And before we hand over to the report presentation, just some um, um, housekeeping rules um, that uh, please can you all uh, stay on mute. I think they're up here in front of you. So please do read those. Uh, we'll be recording this session, so anyone who doesn't want to be recorded, please uh, uh, do not speak or step away. Um, and when you use the Q and A, uh, use the Q and A uh, button tab below uh, on the Zoom function in order to send through questions that you might have, and we'll try and get to them. So that's uh, our introduction, and uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Ashley. Thank you so much, Alan, for that wonderful introduction. I would like you all to think of a small business in your area. Maybe it's a small corner shop or your favorite local restaurant. Oh, sorry, apologies. Or your local mechanic or that BNB that you pass. And now think about them when the lockdown was announced. Border closures stopped all international business and tourist travel. And the restriction of movement and gatherings meant that customers and employees could no longer access these businesses. A curfew narrowed the operating hours for those business, for even those businesses who were deemed essential. While these restrictions were put in place to curb the spread of the disease, the economic impact of the lockdown made the commercial and household demand for goods and services rapidly declined. Some businesses, unable to survive, unfortunately closed. While those who were able to survive and stay open either paid their workers a fraction of their wages or retrench them altogether out of a sheer need for survival. This was the catalyst for the SA Future Trust, knowing that economic activity would nearly grind to a halt and that small businesses and the employees would be hit particularly hard. Oppenheimer Generation Foundation realized that a solution was needed to rapidly deploy funds with as little bureaucracy as possible so that business closures and job losses could be minimized. To do this, the SA Future Trust was created on the 26th of March, and it made its first payment on the 6th of April. It did this by providing five-year interest-free loans to SMEs, and in total was able to extend 1.04 billion rand to 9,656 businesses, which in turn went on to support 92,993 employees. But how did it do this? It was a great collaboration between Oppenheimer Generations Foundation, the South African government, as well as the private sector. Using staff and the initial billion rand donation, it also attracted a further 134 million rand in donations and was set up as a public benefit organization. It partnered with six banks who took on no risk as the loans did not sit on their loan books. However, they were, I, a, they were able to identify qualifying businesses, communicate the existence of the loans and disperse the funds. All of this was done under the assumption that SMEs would not adequately be supported by other COVID relief funds. Small businesses who qualified could apply for the SA Future Trust loans through their bank. They would then nominate their employees who would go on to receive 750 Rand a week for 15 weeks. This would ensure that employees did not suffer significant, e significant income loss and that they would use their income to support themselves and their families. For the businesses, it meant that working capital was freed up and that small jobs were preserved. 
And we, it was the hope that small businesses would then use this funding, this funding that they would have used to pay wages and salaries to cover operating cost. It was therefore the aim that these businesses would remain operational and that jobs and livelihoods were preserved. The SA Future Trust has a 20 year lifespan and it will be operational until 2040. It was created out of an immediate need, but it was envisaged as an organization that would go on to support small businesses as the engines of economic growth. In an effort to get the funds out as quickly as possible, the application process relied on the bank's understanding and the existing information that they had on the SME clients. We therefore sent out an online survey to all loan holders to get a sense of which businesses were supported, where they operated, what the impact of receiving the loan was, and what their perceptions were for the future. We received 2,849 responses, which represent 26% of our total loan book. It must be noted that there is some self-selection bias in the sample, as it was not mandatory to complete the survey. However, we are quite confident that we have adequate representativity of our loan book. The survey ran from October 2020 to March 2021 and asked respondents about the period March 2020 to March 2021. From our initial findings, we found that 97% of respondents at the time of being surveyed reported to still be operational, while 3% reported to have closed. This was our first finding of resilience amongst our cohort. Taking a look at the firm characteristics, we found that even though no gender targets were set, the SA Future Trust reached a significant number of women-owned businesses, with 43% or 1,284 businesses identifying as women-owned. If we look at the sample of businesses who reported to have closed, we see that fewer women-owned businesses closed in comparison to their male counterparts. This is consistent with the research that women present a lower risk to investors and are considered a more reliable group which maintain higher repayment rates with lenders. In order to qualify for a loan, businesses had to meet the following criteria. Businesses should have been operational for two years, be in good financial standing, and have a turnover of less than 25 million rand. From the data, we can see that 72% of businesses reported that they employ fewer than 10 people and earn a probable turnover of between 5 million and 20 million rand. We can therefore conclude that the SA Future Trust made it easier for micro businesses in particular to access credit. Looking at where these businesses operated from, we man the SA Future Trust managed to reach businesses in every single province. This was unsurprising given that we used the banks as the main distributor. We partnered with the banks and they were the ones to disperse the funds. We, the majority of our sample comes from um, Gauteng, the Western Cape and KwaZulu Natal, which are the country's main economic hubs. In terms of sectoral distribution, the sectors, mirror, the sectors that we reached mirrored that of their contribution to GDP, with businesses from the agricultural sector making up just under 3% of, of our respondents, industry making up 28%, and services the majority of the pie at 65%. South Africa is a service-based economy, so we expected this. In the table that you can see on your screen, we have highlighted a few subsectors. From our research, we know that the construction sector was facing an already contracting economy and decreased government spending, which had a negative effect on the industry prior to COVID-19. For manufacturing, they had been experiencing a decline before COVID-19, which was further exacerbated by the lockdown regulations. For those businesses, those ones considered community, social, or personal services. So these are your local businesses, your cleaning businesses, your hairdressers, um, your restaurants, those businesses that you might interact with and that we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. These sell goods and services to people in the community that surrounds them or their province. And so the restrictions had a massive impact on their business operations because they rely on those customers to generate their sales revenue. For the finance, insurance, real estate and business service sector, they, this, the lockdown caused significant disruptions to their supply chain. And lastly, for hospitality and tourism, they were actually in a growth and growth. 
there were 3 million more tourists that came through South African borders between January and February in 2020 and compared to the previous period in 2019. So they went from a period of growth to almost absolute stagnation. In terms of SMEs access to finance, at the time of the survey, so October 2020 to March 2021, SMEs reported to have less than one month's worth of fixed savings on hand in case of an emergency. At this point, it must be noted that the businesses were in lockdown for, had been experiencing the lockdown for six months to a year. And with the consistent changes in regulations that came with the various changes in lockdown levels, it had depleted what little reserves they had on that hand and made them incredibly vulnerable to economic shocks. When asked what type of support they needed, they indicated that they need access to working capital and grant funding if they were to grow and survive. But even in pre-COVID times, they struggled with access to finance. Many businesses reported that they turned to banks or formal lenders, withdrew from their personal savings, or turn to their network of family and friends when they needed to access credit. From the graphic you can see on the right, very few turn to investors, grants, or even small or micro lenders. This indicates to us that there was a funding gap for innovative fi financing for SMEs. If we looked at the impact on employees, we looked at the absolute number, the changes in absolute numbers, and asked businesses to compare what were the employee numbers at the end of 2019 in comparison to 2020? From what we can tell is that more households who were supported by low skilled workers were negatively affected by job losses. From the graph, we can see in red that low skilled workers are nearly double that of high skilled workers. At the beginning of this presentation, I did tell you that the aim of the SA Future Trust was to preserve jobs. And from the data, we can see that that has happened more jobs were preserved than were lost. And in some cases, to our surprise, jobs were even created, despite the very tough economic conditions that SMEs faced. However, the jobs that were created were not enough to offset the jobs that were lost. And it is going to take some time before these are reabsorbed back into the economy. Turning to the application process, we examined the communication channels that were most effective at allowing the SA Future Trust to reach its base. And it's no surprise that the banks came out on top. This shows how effective the partnership was as the majority of SMEs reported, about, reported that they heard about the loan directly from their bank. Industry, associations and TV came in second and third, which means that should we want to create awareness in the future or, the, or if the SME ecosystem wants to promote initiatives, this is the way to do it. Examining the reasons why SMEs applied, we received a lot of qualitative data that are um, qualitative data from SME owners. Most of them said that they applied for the SA Future Trust loan because they wanted to be able to, to provide their workers with the revenue, even if they had no turnover. In some cases, um, they applied for the funds to hold them over until other relief kicked in. And I'll discuss that in a bit. The reasons for applying also were because they were eligible and it had favorable terms. This was after all a five-year interest-free loan that was subordinate to all pre-existing debt and had no liability on the employee. However, given the speed with which the funds were deployed and given that each of the banks had their own systems, there were never to be some hiccups. However, the application process has since closed and all the loans have been onboarded into the SA Future Trust loan management system which has allowed us to streamline the administrative process and hopefully minimize any problems that application, applicants might have in the future. In terms of relief, it must be noted that the SA Future Trust was not the only form of relief that small businesses applied for. At least 50% had applied for some other form of relief, while for the others, it really was the only form of relief they accessed. I think what makes this table on your screen really interesting is the difference between uh, the relief applied for and the app where the applications were successful. Between those two columns, there is quite a stark difference, but this could be because of both supply and demand factors. There could be that the application process was simply too heavy, too compliant heavy, or that the applicants do not meet the qualifying criteria. But if we look at the, where the application was successful and if the relief was 
accepted, we see that nearly in, in nearly all cases where the application was successful, the relief was accepted, which means there was an increased demand and need for this type of relief and for any type of relief during this COVID period so that businesses could survive. Now, once the regulations were eased and the businesses began to open again, businesses need to adapt their workspaces to be aligned with the regulations and create a safe space for their employees and their customers. What this slide tells us is that they were able to introduce social distancing measures by either spacing their workers out or rotating the days that they came in. They could provide masks, screen employees, and sanitize um, the surfaces. But I think what's the most important is that 81% of respondents reported that at most 50% of their staff could work from home, which meant that our underlying assumption of business of employees losing out on income because they could not physically access their workspaces was true. Now, if we look to the future and see what their business owners' perceptions were, I think it's important that we, before we go on to discuss this slide, that we take, that we take note of the context that business owners were responding to. The majority of business owners did answer the survey in February, March this year. And if you think about where we were in that time, we'd just come out of the second wave, we'd been um, shifted to level one, things were opening up, and our vaccination progress had been announced. There was some light at the end of the tunnel. And so this level of optimism is reflected in the, in the financial variables that you see on screen. What we see is that there's positive shifts in the percentage of respondents who thought that their turnover and their profit before tax would increase as they anticipated increased revenues. They also anticipated that their debt servicing costs would decrease, and this was likely to be because of interest rates being kept low, and again, that growth in revenue that they thought maybe would enable them to pay down their debt quicker. And lastly, there were changes in fixed and variable costs. For the fixed cost, this during the lockdown, this was incurred with the purchasing of laptops, data, routers, um, as, well as, the associate, as well as the cost associated with moving back into a physical space, such as rent. And variable costs followed a similar trend as businesses began to increase their production of goods and services. So too did these variable costs increase. It's hard to talk about employment and the future perceptions without talking about the elephant in the room. South Africa, as we all know, has an incredibly high unemployment rate. But we wanted to be able to gauge businesses and their responses to employment changes over the next year and what they thought they might be. Interestingly, we find that they feel that more jobs will be preserved and created than those lost. However, job losses are a concern and indicate that um, the, lock the ongoing lockdown will continue to have a negative effect on both employment and business confidence for the coming months and maybe even years. Due to the economic impact of COVID-19, we asked SMEs what would their biggest challenges be? From the responses, we can see that those hit the hardest were the tourism and hospitality sector, manufacturing and construction sectors. These businesses feared that with many of their peers going out of business, it would lead to consolidation, consolidation in the industry with few, where larger firms would come to dominate. The closure of their peers would also lead to value, value chain and supply chain breakdowns. Another concern was firms being able to substitute capital for labor due to social distance requiring. While this was raised as a significant concern, we think that it is less of a concern than the others, mainly because um, the cost of introducing a capital solution is a permanent long-term cost to what might be a medium-term problem. So a long-term solution to a medium-term problem. And lastly, the cost of credit falling as further interest rates decline. Now, many businesses had to take on a significant amount of debt to survive and to keep their doors open, which might make them undesirable to lenders who view them as riskier clients as the probability of defaulting is a lot higher. So based on our research, what are the implications for the future of the SME ecosystem? Well, for one, we know that we need to target women-owned businesses and provide them with the financial and non-financial support they need to grow. We need to use a sectoral lens or a tailored approach 
to provide an appropriate amount of support to small businesses across the country. We need to build on this momentum and continue to reach a broader base of businesses, especially those who cannot unlock and access traditional financing. We need to fill the gap in the lending market for those businesses with alternative innovative financing products. We need to continue to positively impact low skilled workers' lives and increase the support for SMEs that absorb their type of labor so we can positively impact their households. We can use TV and industry bodies to create awareness around initiatives that are out there to support SMEs. And we need, as, as key stakeholders, to be looking at creating partners that strengthen the support for SMEs. Now, we can't finish without talking about the political unrest that happened in July and caused riots and looting in KZN and Gauteng. We once again sent out a survey to our loan holders, 620 or 6% 6 of our loan holders responded. Um, and as you can see from the map across the country, they were either directly or directly impacted. Now, at the time of being surveyed, 56% that they were up said that they were operational and open, while 44% said that they were closed, but this could, was both a temporary and a permanent basis, as you'll see. Of that 44%, 68% said that they had managed to reopen, and 32% said that they were still closed. And of that 32%, 19% said that they needed a few weeks, so to the end of July, while 37% needed they needed a bit longer until the end of August, while 8% said that they would not, not be able to open their doors again, meaning that we lost some of those businesses. If we examine the differences between the groups that were able to remain open versus those that have not been, we can see that those which have not closed were affected more by the looting and the destruction. But both groups were affected by the category other, which is the intimidation of employees and customers from accessing their businesses and the business confidence that dropped. In terms of how they were impacted, about uh, many of them said that they suffered significant financial loss as well as employment loss and would need support in both the short, medium and long term in order to survive. And given that access, the financial loss was so great, they once again indicated a need for access to finance as well as in some cases employee support if they were to survive. I'd like to thank you so much for listening to this presentation and encourage you to download the report and to read for further information. And I'd like to hand back to Alan for any questions that might have come through. Thanks, Ashley. You know, what uh, stood out for, for me there was um, a couple of things there was uh, no bureaucracy that the intention, you know, when you started was to remove the bureaucracy. And we know, you know, just in the one slide where you see what uptake, uh, what uptake there is in all the other funds versus yours. That together with collaboration and how you collaborated with both government and uh, the the industry, the the banking industry and various other private sector players, I think is a model that seems to be getting at last some traction. But my question to you, yeah, is around um, the actual uh, SFT um, itself in terms of the um, the fund. Uh, what was the mandate like? And did it meet the mandate? Do you believe it was successful from, uh, from what you intended to what it actually produced? Or did it meander on the way as you learned what was going on in the market? So I think part of what, what the aim of the fund was, was to um, preserve jobs um, and help SMEs remain operational. And I think based on, you know, it might be different in that we didn't get all those businesses who closed, we didn't get responses from them. But the fact that 97% of respondents remained operational a year after the pandemic means that it had achieved that. And the fact that more jobs were preserved than lost meant that it also achieved that objective. So I think it set up its design, allowed it to achieve what it was meant to. And when we also look at the qualitative responses of businesses, you know, we asked, what was the impact of this in your business? And people said, you know, wow, it really helped. Um, hold over my business. I could, I could keep my employees. Um, I could pay my bills. And so I think, in terms of both the quantitative data as well as the qualitative data, I think it confirms that it did achieve its objective. And I think it's going to go on quite a journey determining what its new objective would be um, and how it's going to meet that. 
Uh, over to you, uh, Emmanuel, who uh, you were also co-author of, of this report. Uh, on one of the slides, it, uh, it there was this uh, statistic that um, most of the respondents had less than one month's cash uh, to cover their costs. And yet, um, when I looked at the other, the one of the other slides, it spoke about three percent. If I if I read correctly, three percent closed down. So that shows a high level of resilience, but there's a contradiction there. There's over less than a month's worth of uh, overhead cover, and yet only 3% uh, shut down. Okay. So do you think there is just a higher level of resilience? It, uh, does the research show there's a high level of resilience among South African small businesses? Um, or is it that they just borrowed from a whole bunch of sources that we didn't anticipate? I think you can you can you can say from the findings that the firms that benefited from the intervention um, were able to master significant levels of resilience against the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic, from having 69% uh, of them having only one month worth of annual fixed costs now saying that they expect their turnover and profit before tax to increase by end of 2021. It means that the fund made a significant difference and something must have changed on the ground in reality for them to be able to say that. Now that is tremendous, a tremendous change in the financial position. The second thing in the study <coughs> finding, sorry, that um, indicates resilience is that they were able to save more jobs than they lost at different levels of scale across all sectors of South Africa's economy. Now that is against the backdrop of uh, the current level unemployment levels we, we, we are seeing, that must tell you that they've been extremely resilient. Uh, also remembering the fact that even before the pandemic, South Africa's economy was experiencing a technical recession with unemployment on an upward trend. So, so, and the third thing I could say is that they anticipate that by the end of 2021, they will actually create and preserve more jobs than they would lose. Now, that is tremendous, a very positive uh, uh, perspective to the, on the future and a glimmer of hope uh, for, for, the, for the firms that benefited from the funds intervention uh, against the backdrop of, of what we are seeing in South Africa's macroeconomy as a whole. That is tremendous resilience, yes. Thanks, Emmanuel. You know, over to you, Carl. And you know, as somebody who's involved in the small business uh, ecosystem, uh, we both uh, have been involved for a long time. You, you of course, uh, heading up SASA, SME um, Association with a huge amount of members. I, I mentioned in in my intro that I, a lot um, resonated with my experience, but there were some differences. And and what I had have seen is. Um, that in some, in, in, in more than anticipated instances, COVID-19 accelerated businesses. Like some businesses, this was actually the, 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 the ship had come in, you know, the, the, this was their ticket to growth, which was very counterintuitive as uh, COVID broke. Uh, so it, within your members, do, do you see this, uh, any correlation between what you're experiencing with your membership and what the um, this research is, is, is telling us? Yes, indeed. Um, I think the research uh, probably confirms a lot of the, the thoughts we had. I'm almost uh, cynical to ask, ought we, ought we to be thanking COVID for opening up? <laughs> or ought we be thanking COVID for uh, clearing out all the myths uh, that existed? So I, I do think this question of finance as raised by Ashley, is terribly important um, all the time, at every level. Uh, we've got to be able to, I know the Reserve Bank is busy looking at, uh, at some other products. I'm not so sure about bank receptivity. With the power of the Brenthurst Trust name and all that it means, it is likely that they played along. Uh, and it is unlikely that they will play along where there's any more risk. Uh, and that continues as before COVID as now. Um, I'm really intrigued uh, at Ashley uh, and Emmanuel using the word we, uh, obviously referring to the trust. I hope one day we'll be able to use the word we when we talk about the SME ecosystem, uh, that we do this as and together. Um, 
with the voice of small business. Uh, and so I'm concerned about that. But thank you for the report. Uh, it, it clarified uh, a lot of issues. Uh, I'm arguing strongly for government to do a broad research on SME. We do not have that in South Africa. Uh, Stat South Africa tell me they don't have the funds. So I suppose private sector has to dip in uh, so that we cannot get it. We one of the countries that do not cannot tell us a big picture of South African SMEs, small business. We know when they do well, we know when they fall out, but we don't know what the intention is, the intentionality in, in the business community for new ideas and new products for manufacturing. Can I leave it there? Yeah, but let, let me just ask you another question while, while you um, with us now is, you know, for, for me, I, I look at all the, um, the recommendations from, from, from this research and you know, having been in this uh, ecosystem like you have for many years, we see this uh, and there's two, uh, there's a little bit of cynicism uh, from, from my perspective as to whether government or industry, as you mentioned, that the banking system might have some resistance, but can, can these, uh, these uh, recommendations be, this sort of, uh, can it be implemented? And do you think there will be, other than the, the banking system, which you said the, you, you mentioned before, other pockets of resistance? Because what I've seen, once again, is that there's many recommendations that are completely logic, logical based in research and what we see on the ground, and yet somehow, you know, we, we always make the count, counterintuitive policies, in, 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 even in the, with all this research. I thank you for that, very really important, because I was a banker for 30 years uh, before doing this. And uh, in those days, uh, your bank manager was very close to your client. Today, your client sees a screen or a answering center of machines and sees a very junior person. And one of the things the banks and other firms, firms who deal with ESD, don't understand is that when their employee meets an SME, he is meet, he or she is meeting an owner of a business uh, who has huge risks. And the employer who interviews the SME is covered by a salary, uh, is, is secure, and has several levels upwards to go in the organization to get a yes. And it's therefore so easy to turn away a small business at the front desk. We've got to sharpen the front desk of our firms uh, and, and government. I mean, I keep fighting with government, the CEDA and CIFA. Their front desks are terrible. It, it, it turns you away, uh, the responses you get. And so I'm glad to see my picture is up uh, and invite you all to to meditate on it. <laughs> uh, please, we beat the poor small business with so many things, yet we feed it with the worst fertilizer we have. Uh, we need to get into that pot and chuck out some of that soil and start anew. And this is not going to be done alone. This has to be done at NEDLAC. The big thing here, NEDLAC, and I will call on everybody to help me. I'm fighting to get a seat for the voice of small business at NEDLAC. The current people representing us at NEDLAC are corporate wise people and people under a company or government policy. But we don't hear the raw voice of SME. That's why um, this uh, particular research is so important as to come out more often and from a variety of places. So please help me fight with government to see that we can get a seat at NEDLAC. And the second thing I ask you to help turn the soil around to this plot is that we have an SME Act, which tells the minister that she has to, or he has to appoint a National Small Business Advisory Council. Now we all know what advisory councils are. I'm not going to do that, but it's an access to your, 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 your audience at all levels. So, for 10 years, since uh, Davies, through Zulu, through the, uh, the previous one, 
and I don't know what the next one is going to do. They have not appointed an advisory council. Now, how the hell do they hear what the community says? Who is taking up this Brenta's trust research and, and forcing them to look at it? Unless Brentes is represented by somebody on that council, there's no way that we can say that the Brentes report, no matter how good or how influential, will be taken up um, at, at the Department of Small Business. So the two, two levels I really call upon immediately. I mean, I, my thing to the small business is they must get to act together and start talking with one voice. But for this for this uh, particular presentation, I call upon government to, uh, for the minister, it says so in the act, the minister has to appoint a national small business advisory council. The latest reason I've been given, they don't have any money. Well, I tell you. And uh, the to big business, I call upon them to support the calling for a seat for small business at NEDLAC. At NEDLAC, we are represented as small business. We are represented by corporate people who in their BCOM, et cetera, and a little reading of have discovered small business, but they have no idea what it is to be an owner. So uh, I can go on uh, a lot. Yeah. But I... Carl, Carl we've, we've got to give uh, Nadia some airtime yeah, here. Please, but, um, but uh, just uh, maybe a response to that is I would disagree with you that they put bad fertilizer. In my experience is something they most often put salt in, in that. that <laughs> That pot plant there, but over to um, all things spices. Nadia, you you have three restaurants. Uh, what you know, we we know what happened with lockdown. What effect did it have? Uh, somebody on the ground. What effect did uh, COVID nineteen? Like, give, give us the. We know it was hard. Give us like some detail as to what you went through as an entrepreneur owning three restaurants in March last year. Yeah, just give us a sense of that. Sure, Lord, and it wasn't just hard, it was soul crushing, um, to be quite honest, right? And so um, at the time we had two restaurants um, on either side of Cape Town. And when March um, rolled on, you know, at, at practically a spur of the moment, we went into hard lockdown. Um, and so what did that mean? Because we had stock on hand um, and we are kind of a fresh produce kind of restaurant. So, you know, everything is fresh. We don't use deep freeze, frozen anything. And so all the stock we had to get rid of. Um, and so we had to try and do it in a way. I mean, how do you write off as a small business so much money? And you know, giving it away to charitable organizations and to our staff is great, but actually as a business that, that doesn't speak to anything. Um, and we thought, you know what, it's we, you know, the, the Afrikaans work, because Afrikaans is such a beautiful language. You, we, have, we must just fuss bait for like one month, right? Because that was the promise of government was if we all lock down for a month, we'll be okay. Um, and the restaurant industry has really borne the brunt of, of, of lockdowns subsequently because it wasn't just a month, right? Um, we had zero operations for the month. And then for the next three months, we could only do um, restaurant deliveries, right? And we were never set up as a delivery kind of restaurant. And just to tell you, we had Uber Eats and Misty Delivery, um, you know, on their platforms, but they take 33% commission from the, so from the restaurant. So I'm paying 33% on every sale. That's that's my margin. That's every that's all money going. And we only used to do it because it used to um, help us with you know advertising for the restaurant. So that was the and the convenience for the customer. I'm luckily an engineer. So when we could um, trade and we could do um, restaurant deliveries, I set up our own uh, website and our own delivery system using our staff. But it's it's really difficult for a restaurant and a business model to go from, you know, a sit down high end restaurant to suddenly doing deliveries, right, for three months. And then when we open up again, we are opening up at 50% capacity. And I can tell you that, um, you know, I had two landlords. One was an absolute gem and completely understood the environment and gave us the interviews. The other one sent us a lawyer's letter that said, if you don't pay, we will evict you, right? And then we had to take a strategic decision to go, how are we going to manage this with, you know, very much, you know, similarly, we've got about a month of, of runway here. And we had to do the heart wrenching decision of closing a restaurant operation um, and, and a brand that we put our heart and our soul into. Um, and so that kind of gut wrenching process of, of loss, right? Because that's what happened. We lost a business in the process. It's part of one group, but it was one of the brands. Um, 
And then, you know, we were going along and, and start, things started clearing up and July came and, you know, you know, and um, last year and things were looking up. And then we opened another brand, a smaller one um, in September. Um, and, and then things were going well. We were every and every restaurant was holding on for, for December, right? Because that's when our trade goes up. And then just, December comes and government goes again, lockdown and curfews. And so, and, and the unfairness for our industry is we see all these other industries, if you go into any shopping center, it's chocolate block, but the restaurant industry keeps being locked down and shut down and curfewed to the nth degree that as an entrepreneur in this space, it's really, really tough to be able to kind of plan ahead and invest and have the foresight and the vision to hold on as much as you can. We are lucky because we were fully halal restaurants, so we never encountered, so alcohol sales was not part of our business model. But many of the restaurants, that's their lifeblood, that's where they make the profits, that's where they make the turnover, right? And so for them, it's been devastating. And so, you know, when we, we talk about, um, you know, holding on in an industry, you know, my heart bleeds for our sector because there's a very limited understanding of what it takes to be in the sector. And then it's not just the lockdowns and everything. Very quickly, we've just gone through rolling blackouts. So when the minute the, the electricity goes, the, you know, everything else goes, we get fuel increases, so food price increases, but our customers don't want to pay more for food when they go sit into a restaurant, right? And so we're starting to lose customers because of the environment. And then a very funny quick story is um, we opened up a, a, a third restaurant. So I think my husband and I are insane because there's a borderline between genius and insanity. And I think we we be on the insane side. Um, and because we're a Turkish restaurant and we're fully authentic Turkish, we ship in a lot of our products and our services. And um, we... And if, you know, we all laughed at that little ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, but we had a container ship coming into port in Cape Town. And just as it arrived in port, in, in port Transnet had a cyber attack. And so that means that they couldn't offload any container. And I've got friends who are in our industry who had food goods on those containers that all went to waste, right? And so we're not just talking about a COVID economy and, you know, when you go, no, we're not, we're working short stuff because of COVID, right? That's great for corporates that you can work short stuff for COVID, but as a restaurant that's hustling on the front line that really needs, we, we had no chairs for our restaurant to open. We had to hire in chairs, which are additional costs, right? So every time a corporate institution that has the overheads to allow people to work at 30% capacity and government departments that can work at 20% capacity or work from home, we don't have those luxuries. Yeah, so, so if I can just move over to, you, know, you, you, you made that, that insanity story that you went to three, uh, from two to three. So part of my question to you is like, why would you do that at this time? I mean, what was behind your thinking? But you were one of the, the applicants to the, the SAFT uh, uh, funding. Um, did it really, did it like really help? I mean, was it significant in, in assisting you or was it, just uh, another thing to have. So, so we in, in my other life, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. So I can I can safely say this, right? When we were consolidating um, and and going from two restaurants to one restaurant and looking at what our runway looked like, sometimes it's not. We didn't need a million rand, right? Sometimes we just needed a little bit of a cash injection to help get us through the really tough times. And that was what that grant was for. Um, and it was my grant, but a loan funding was for, right? And because it came with no strings, it didn't come with kind of a huge, you know, it wasn't an interest rate attached to it and that it was a five-year plan. So, you know, so I, I have five years to pay back that loan. I'm just very honest, I haven't yet paid it back. Um, right? And that was because it gave us the space. It gave us a little bit of breathing room. It also gave us the opportunity to save our best staff, right? If you think about the, the biggest challenge in business is not always money, it's actually on talent. And we were able to save our best talent Everybody took a salary cut um, through the process. And then we looked at um, what is it that we can offer our staff in terms of economies of scale that help reduce their running costs, right? So we said, okay, your, your, your salary is being reduced, but we're gonna pay for staff transport because I can negotiate with staff transport. We'll give you, we'll make meals for you during lunch so you don't have to bring food in. So your, your food costs reduced, right? So, so as a business, we started to be like really smart around how is it that we think about staff attraction and retention. And we saved a whole lot of staff in the process, right? 
and and it was it was literally like four really hard gut wrenching months, right? And then we started coming out. And now you go, Nadia, why would you invest in? Uh, I mean, we've we've just made completed the largest restaurant investment we've made, and we've done it at a premium location at the VNA waterfront. And everybody goes, Nadia, why the heck would you open up the restaurant in a pandemic when? We, and this is kind of the second restaurant we're opening up in the pandemic. We've brought mm. the brand back that we closed in March last year. And a couple of things, right? So we really hope that this happening. The same thing is that seen. I'm tired of eating my own food. Everybody's tired of eating their own food, and people are looking for unique experiences, right? Mm. The third thing is that people, in landlords specifically, are more negotiable now than they were. You see, right at the beginning of the lockdown, they were like, no, this is it, then you've got to pay it, right? Because they also thought that it was going to be, you know, a two-month, three-month process. 18 months later, everybody's more negotiable um, around goods and services, right? And so that's why we we were able to go to the to, to the waterfront. We would never have been able to go through. And, and so, you know, if I think about what are the key inflection points for a business in the process, sometimes it's the right kind of capital at the right point that makes all the difference in the world. So, so Nadia, that's a good segue into, you know, so what I'm reading on the, the Q&A and the, the chat here, to maybe just address to Ashley and, and uh, Emmanuel. There's a, you know, I, I spoke about like the, in my experience, the, the ship had come in for many businesses, COVID had presented a huge opportunity, but there's also been mass devastation and in the report, you know, you've got a three, I think it was also a 3% shutdown. Uh, it was a low shutdown rate. And there seems to be a dissonance between what your report is showing and what uh, people have been experiencing, um, let's, let's say anecdotally uh, in, in the market. So can you, either of you um, talk to that? Sure, I think what's important. So number one, the you asked the survey in March, 2021, right? And when in answering that, those businesses who could have closed might not be checking the emails. We sent the link to the survey with their statements and they might not have been checking the emails. And so we could have missed a whole lot of data, maybe not a whole lot, but maybe some of the data we didn't have access to as to why they closed. And this is our first report and it might be something that we need to put more resources into in the future to finding out how those businesses are doing. It was also, we hadn't entered the third wave of the of, of COVID-19 here in South Africa, a wave that we know has caused mass devastation to businesses across the country. And so the numbers aren't reflective of this very, very current time, but are reflective of maybe earlier this year when things were looking a little bit better. Um, so we do acknowledge that some of the businesses might close and we do know of some businesses who are in business rescue um, and they are communicate with the, the South African Future Trust team to say they can no longer pay their um, loans, but we, we can't give you an accurate number until the five-year period is finished and we can see what is still sitting on our loan book. Let, let me move to you, um, Emmanuel, around, the, you know, one of the questions around why the agricultural sector, which is a huge employer, um, uh, they only represented 3% of the, uh, the, the funding that was uh, taken up. Is that a function of the fact that they weren't really affected? They weren't, they, they didn't know about it or something that uh, we, we're missing completely? Why was it so low as a percentage? I think it reflects the, the general state of the sector in terms of its value addition to GDP growth. Um, agriculture sector has been declining the last four decades in most African countries um, due to several reasons. Uh, a cutback in government funding for the sector. It was at issues like uh, we had some climate change and variability challenges. You have El Nino and La Nina. <coughs> one was a drought, one was a flood. Um, so, and, and, the, and basically uh, several challenges such as poor R&D, the amount of uh, resources committed to research for the sector has also been declining significantly. So it's been a neglected sector uh, that has been declining over the last four decades uh, in most African countries, including South Africa. So you'd notice that uh, its contributions to GDP is around 2% in South Africa and, and, and much, much less than four decades ago in most other African countries. And that, that reflects what you see in terms of how many firms are even alive and functioning in that sector to even apply for the loan in the first place. It's a reflection of the state of the sector in general. 
Uh, thanks, Emmanuel. Just uh, back to you, Carl. Um, you know, we've been talking about, and you know, we both seem to be, you know, grey-haired cynics um, around the ability of uh, government to uh, collaborate with private sector and various other stakeholders. But what I saw, and I, I tweeted about this at the time during the riots, I saw an incredible collaborative um, feeling in the, in the country where people were actually had got to the point where if we don't collaborate, then we are all doomed. I felt, I felt a shift from government, and I don't know if that was just me, but certainly amongst my, my peers, that we felt there was a shift, a softening of government's anti-business stance, which it seems like, and there was sort of an, an understanding from private sector to not be so cynical as, as uh, maybe you and I are. So in closing now, you know, if, if I had to challenge you, um, how do, what, what do we have to do in order to collaborate better. Who needs to collaborate with whom? And who needs to take the research that we're seeing in front of us and apply it in a collaborative way? And like, how would that really happen? Well, it, it must happen with a sit down. It must happen with a dialogue. Uh, the European Union has got a product which they did for the Eastern European countries absorption into the European um, group of countries. And they called it deliberative engagement. It's a, it, it is where, uh, um, in talking the ecosystem, big business, government, and small business sit down together at the top level, but as the UN reminds us, also at the bottom level. That's why our municipal elections is terribly important. Because at that level, you need to bring in the local uh, business knowledge through, this, uh, through the commerce. You need to bring in the community and you bring in the municipality. We just, I just spoke to somebody who's returned to open a business in uh, Langa. And she says, everybody says I must bring back my talents. And, but I come here and I stand knee deep in sewerage. Now, that is something that Big business together with small business must say to government, you can't have that. You can't, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, I, be, I believe this whole subject is an ongoing long-term thing. The big thing for Brenta's Trust, for Brenta's Trust is that your, your research and your document is very good and we need more of it and we need continuous growth. But we, you are not supposed, well, you are doing, Band-Aid, you are doing Red Cross work. At, when Red Cross was created at the end of a war, when, when, at the end of a war, Red Cross was created to deal with the wounded, the, the people dying, and so on. It somehow now as a crutch. We need, we need different kinds of, that's why I argue so hard that we need a seat at NEDLAC in this country. We need, we need a seat that can talk beyond Band-Aid and Red Cross work. Am, am I expecting oh. too much? No, I don't think, I really don't think so. I think uh, if we're not in dialogue, I think that is the first step. Um, but, you know, um, perhaps um, we can drive that all together a little bit harder to, to get that seat, seat at the table. But we've come to the end of, of the session, and I just want to thank uh, each and every one of you, Ashley Finmunda, um, uh, one of the researchers, together with Emmanuel Awusa Sashira, uh, doctor, I must say he worked hard for that doctorship, so <laughs> doctor, um, uh, Carl Lotta, who um, the, the fighter for, for small and medium-sized businesses in South Africa, um, and of course, Nadia Musaji, who is um, one of my favorite people in the world, an entrepreneur, uh, and you know, showed the absolute resilience. And I love the, the comeback from two to one to three and take that COVID-19. A big, uh, big thank you to SA Future Trust for all the work they've put into, into this. And if you want to download the report, it's there on your screen in front of you uh, where you can see the report. And of course, uh, Thank you to everyone who's participated here as, as uh, viewers, and uh, uh, we hope you enjoyed and found this uh, very informative. Thank you very much from everyone at SA Future Trust.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.